All right. So yeah, what's up this week? Um, I just wanted to um have a um a quick question about um what you guys do. I kind of roughly know what you guys do, but um after a challenge, um one thing I struggle with more like from a coaching point of view is um what direction to take the next part of the the client journey on so like they do a challenge they have really high motivation and they get great results um and then how to kind of other than the sessions what to deliver and how to deliver it to kind of multiple people to ensure that they're still getting great results because i kind of have a challenge the challenge finishes and then like we have a, an ongoing program that i coach people with but they're kind of the effort and the amount of pe people that show up to calls and things like that, it like drifts off as soon as the challenge finishes. Um, I know you guys do your um, your grading system, which mm -hmm. I'm starting to do. I was meant to do one um, this week, the first week of November, but I had to go into lockdown, so I haven't done it. Um, but I didn't know if you have any other things other than the grading, the gamification oh, well, system. That's well, that's pretty much it. The answer's right there. It's our grading, it's our long-term back-end programming. So there is nothing else really. What you're asking here is how, how do you structure your back end program essentially? Yeah, basically, yeah. Long-term program. Yeah. So the grading system um, for us, in case uh Seamus and anyone else listening to the recording of this isn't isn't familiar with it. Um it's essentially, you know, we just break we just break our back end program into 90-day cycles of programming. So every 90 days, the client uh, can essentially put themselves forward if they want to. They haven't got to take part in the system, but you know, everyone does because it gives them more accountability, more, more something to strive for, more gamification. So just like a martial arts or karate color belt system, it's, it's just a, a new level of fitness that they can, they can um, come in to do a, a grading test every, which we'll do every 90 days anyway. And, um, yeah, they, they, I mean, pretty much all the clients do it. They'll input for their, they'll come in for their um, grading assessment, uh, depending on the level they're on. They get awarded with their next um, level. You know, so we have like, for a woman, we have like a ruby, sapphire, diamond, and emerald level. Uh, I'm not sure which order that's in, but it's it makes sense to the woman for some reason. Uh, so they, they, they go along with that. And um, that's, that's essentially done to um, help them keep getting results uh, and, and keep them having purpose, which is what a lot of clients don't have after a six week challenge or whatever, because they're so focused, because we even in a sense made them kind of focus on a short term result, like dropping 20 pounds or losing a dress size. We are very careful at the beginning to tell the people that that's not what it's all about. It's really about the long term but they're still focused in that initial period on, on, a, on an aesthetic result. And long-term, you know, we need to condition them that they can't expect that kind of result to keep happening. They're not gonna lose another 20 pounds in the next six weeks. And if we don't, and, and so we wanna change their focus, the back-end package is really about performance. The back-end program is all about performance or, uh, you know, rather than looks. So, uh, which is just how the way we train athletes, essentially. So we tell them that, you know, if they keep getting fitter, they keep achieving these benchmarks that in three months, six months, nine months, or a year from now, when they're able to, for example, do five pull-ups and uh, squat, uh, you know, uh, 1.2 times their body weight, they're going to look like someone who can, who can do those kind of fitness things. So we change their mindset to focus on, on uh, performance goals long-term because you can't keep their focus on uh, physical goals or they're going to be demotivated very quickly. Uh, and that's where a lot of people will, um, I think that's the, the main reason why a lot of clients drop off long-term for a lot of fit pros. Even if you give great service and um, you, you're giving great results, you think, but if they have lost their sense of purpose, they don't know why they're doing this anymore or, or, they're, or they think they're doing it to keep losing more and more weight. 
and they're only looking at the scale and they're not looking at their performance long-term metrics, then they're going to quit and go and find the next shiny object. So that's going to happen no matter how good your customer service is, no matter how many social events you do, no matter how many times you check in through the week. If they lose purpose, they will think you're brilliant, the best trainer ever. They'll have loads of fun and they'll still say, I'm quitting. And you guys have probably all experienced that, right? Uh, when, you know, you're like, what's wrong? Why are you leave? You've been here six months. Why are you leaving? What's the matter? And they say, no, everything's great. You're amazing. I love the sessions. It's so much fun. You can't do anything else, but I'm going to try this thing now. And what it really is, they can't articulate it, or maybe they just don't want to. But the fact is they, in their mind, you've, you've failed to communicate that there's still progress and purpose in what you're doing. Um, but you've not be essentially, you've not given them the carrot on a stick to carry on. And so they think there's no carrot and they think they may as well try something different and try and recreate that initial 20 pounds off in a week that they got the first time they did it. And of course, it's not going to work and they're going to fail. And again, and they'll look for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Uh, and so it's really important that we condition them long term with that mentality. And so that's, so for me, really, the customer service side is is pretty simple to dial in, right? You do social events, you do fun things, you reach out and, and have individual communication with all your clients. Um, but most of the pros are doing that. We've learned about that for the last 10 years. Me and other mentors have told you to do all that, right? And the reason you're, if you're still not getting retention, it's not because you're not like contacting people one-to-one -one enough, right? It's because they don't see a purpose in carrying on with you. They think they've got the results they're going to get with you. Uh, you know, business mentoring is notorious for this. I've had, you know, a few people over the years, they come into our mentoring program. Uh, the first thing we do in a week is we help them get their Facebook ads working. And now they're generating five leads a day. And then they think that they think after that, that they don't kind of like need us anymore. And they're like, oh, okay, I've got my, my Facebook ads working. I'll take it from here. I'll scale to an eight figure fitness company. I've got this. <laughs> and we're like, no, you know, there's, there's kind of more things. We can start the real work now. And lead generation is an easy problem to fix that you've obsessed your entire life over. We fixed it in one week. Now we've got real work to do. But they're like, no, 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 no. It's like, you know, I've, as long as my ads work, I can take it from here because I've got good certifications or my clients love me. And it's like, okay, bro, let's see how that, let's see where you end up in one year from now then, right? And they always end up in a worse position. So in those cases, that's, that's where we have failed to communicate to those people that, that marketing, the first initial surface level shiny object results are what they come for. But then they, they should realize that there's a, there's a lot more real work to do then for, for real long-term success and sustainability. And so that's, that's really where it comes down to. That's the point of the grading system. And that is you know what we believe really is what um, holds our retention so high, even in bigger and bigger numbers, uh, because people need a goal. They need to have something to focus on. Otherwise, they're just coming to you for a workout three times a week for leisure. So, you know, you need all, you need the foundation of customer service and individual communication and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, no matter how nice you are or how much time you give people, if they're not progressing, if there's no growth, they will get bored and leave. So it's down to them, of course, to show up and put the work in and set bigger goals. But it's also down to you to check in every, every 90 days and kind of do a whole new consultation with them. Uh, people always ask me when someone comes to the end of a contract or they come to the end of, um, you know, they, they pay for six months and they they come to the end, they say, what do I do with that client now? And then you do the same thing. You, 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 you have another consult with them. You, you, you help them figure out what are their next set of goals and you prescribe them a program for that length of time to get those next goals. And that's what you do with each of your clients forever. It's very simple, right? They came to you with a problem. They wanted to reach a goal. You prescribe them your program for a certain length of time to achieve that goal. When they've reached that goal, or they've come to the end of that time frame, you have another consult with them 
and you set aside their next goals and then you'll prescribe another program such as that. So that is an overview of our, of our grading system or, or more technically why we do it. And, um, you know, that, that little bit of why we do it and, and why we think that's the ultimate retention strategy. So um, Callum, I don't know if that answers your question or if there's something else specific that you're looking for that I've not gone into. No, that was great. I was going to ask that next thing as well about the kind of six month thing as well. I was going to have that question. Um, is, so, you know, what's prompting the question? Is it, are you seeing it like a drop off at a certain length of time or a retention problem or what? Like what's... Um, no, I just see it from a kind of like more of a, like a direction of like uh, they finish a six week challenge and then um, what's the kind of next direction for them to continue to get great results. Like I said, I was going to start implementing this um, anyway. It's going to be my first yeah. testing day at the start of November, but I had to change it. Um, but so, yeah, and, and the second yeah, and part was, sorry, carry on. Go on. Sorry. And then the second part, part was about what to, what process to then take, because I've only just started doing six month paid in falls. Um, well, since I started working with you in like March, people are then coming to the end of their process. And then I was kind of not really knowing what to, what you know, approach to take. It's easiest, it's always easiest to renew people on what they just paid for. If, if you know, like they paid six months, because you just assume, first of all, you want to start from the assumption that those clients are going to be with you forever. Because why wouldn't they be, right? They've not like mastered health and fitness anytime soon. <laughs> and if they have mastered their fitness goals, you can still work with a client 20 years from now on just on their mindset, basically, and, and training with them to develop their mind look at martial arts you know, and I think I think this probably comes more naturally to me than a lot of other fit pros which maybe I take for granted because I've got a my background was in martial arts since I was 15 I was a martial arts instructor at 19 and then I went into strength and athletic strength and conditioning which was you know very elite level fitness programming so things like writing a 12-month program for somebody is kind of just like normal to me um, you know, whereas if I'm, or, or creating a boot camp, uh, a group, large group training program with multiple people doing different lifts and, and different, um, elements of plyometric core strength, mobility, stability, functional movement screening, things like that. That's just the first thing I ever learned in fitness. So that just comes second nature to me, but I know a lot of PTs or, or a lot of you guys who maybe come from one-to-one -one PT backgrounds, and then you've come into like boot camps and you know there hasn't really been much real education in, in the industry on how to properly program for groups um whereas in strength and conditioning it's been done that way for many many decades so so that kind of structure of the martial arts system continual progression um and also knowing that in martial arts for example when you're a black belt or you're a third or a fourth or a fifth dan black belt, which you've been doing it for 15 years and you're still doing hard, intense training, whether it's like fitness training or you're doing um, like skills, like punches and kicks technique training, and you're given really intensely hard training, like on top of a mountain, not because they're trying to teach you how to punch because you know how to punch. They're not giving you a thousand sit-ups because they want to get your core stronger. You already have a strong core. Uh, same as the Marines. With the Marines have their, um, was it Hell Week? I think it is, where it's just like ridiculously crazy hard training. For, they're not trying to get your VO2 max up in that week. The point of doing the intense training, whether you're a fifth dan martial artist or, or elite level athlete or in the military, at that level, after you've been training for 10 years or something in that, you're getting that kind of training to develop your mindset. And, and so, you know, to me with fitness, it's the same with that way. If, if I help, if I take Susan, a mum of two, who's 20 pounds overweight when she starts working with me, then yeah, okay, the first six weeks we'll use to boost her confidence and show her she can get some initial results to give her a good feedback loop and also to help her realize she can enjoy the process of fitness. Then the next year, maybe two years, is going to be all around helping her build sustainable habits and start to slowly, the keyword, slowly modify her lifestyle because when it, to fit it around her health and fitness goals. 
because when a client comes to you, first of all, they are trying to fit health and fitness around other things in their life. Over time, when you help them get their, raise their self-empowerment, their level of confidence, their level of self-esteem, and, and help them appreciate themselves, then they, like you, will start to build other areas of life around their core of themselves, their fitness and their mindset work. You know, that comes for, the, for leaders in society, that comes first. You wake up and you sort out yourself, your fitness, your health, your breakfast, your meal planning, your mindset work, your journaling, before you can do other things like kids, work, family, whatever. And you do that, those things, because you need to do them to be your strongest, to give your best to your work, your kids, your career, your partner, and so on. So the next couple of years, we're really helping our clients really, it's a mindset journey. And we tell them that on day one, we say, look, this is 99% mindset and personal development. And it's 1% about diet and exercise. You already know how to do a push-up. You already know that an apple is better than a Mars bar. There's not much you're going to learn here about that kind of thing. Like <laughs> it really is move more and eat less crap, right? So really it's mindset from day one. And we're helping them over one or two years because we only have we only have them three hours a week. They get 157 hours a week to fuck it up on their own. So we only got three hours a week with them to really um, instill these habits and, and then after that kind of one or two year mark, that's when you know you've, you, you see it in someone, you see when they've clicked, right? And you just know that it's their lifestyle now and they, they love it, they live it, they breathe it. They wanna wear your clothes all the time. They wanna become a coach. They wanna pack in their job and work with you. You know, you've kind of converted someone to your little cult of health and fitness, right? Um, that's when you know you've got someone converted for life. So to me, the journey of a, the client journey is getting them to that point, which could be one to two years before you've really got them anywhere. And then after that point, you know, there's not much else you can physically take that client. Maybe they want to do a photo shoot or compete in an Ironman competition. But, you know, generally, these are not pro athletes. These are not people with aspirations to be cover models. Um, you know, they just want to use their fitness results in their day-to-day -day life or their mindset results in their, in their career or for their relationships or their parenting. So, so we want to get them to that two, one to two year point. And once they click and we've converted them, generally our lifetime, our client, our client journey from there, uh, the next level of increasing our lifetime value of a customer or the next level of upsell, so to speak, is then to get them working for our company. So that's when we actually take a change where a customer, after that one to two year period, it takes about 18 months in our gym, I think on average, about 18 months, depending on how fit they are when they come in. But about 18 months, we've kind of got them to a level of client where they're, they're not gonna, like they're, they're not gonna grow much more physically. They're not gonna get much more physical results after that point. Um, they could do with a bit of specialization, but it's not really what they're looking for. If they're, if they're, they're down to 12% body fat, they're not concerned about getting to 8% body fat at this point because we're not working with athletes. We're just working with the everyday people. At that point then, when we, when we know that they're, they're where they are, and more importantly, they're happy and they're content where they are, they know, yeah, I'm 12% body fat, I'm 10%, but I'm okay with this. I'm really happy. I'm seeing results in my life beyond what I look like. Now you know that they're in the right place. That's usually then when we extend the conversation to them or most often they come to us and we say, how would you like now, now you've grown to that good enough level. Would you like to turn around and give it to somebody else? Have you thought about a career doing this and doing what we do? And nine out of time, 10 times they say yes. So they can enter into our ambassador program or our internships, or as is the case right now, two of our clients have, are, en are entering into franchise agreements with us doing this. They're, they're like, you know what? I want to be a coach, but I also want to own one of your gyms and have a franchise. Where do I, where do, I do that? So, so we're seeing this now. And, and since the hub has been running for about three years, this is happening more and more right now. So that's on a, on a really advanced level 
I know we're going well beyond the question now, but on, on a real meta advanced level, long term, that's where our LTV, that's where our, our client journey goes. The, after one or two years of the client, basically, like there's not a lot more you can actually do to progress them in terms of your regular program. There really isn't like, you know, there's not. Um, it kind of reaches the ceiling of lifetime value in regards to what we are doing. So really the only level to go beyond that and for them to add more value to their life is to give them a way to contribute their growth, you know, which Tony Robbins, people will know that's the two spiritual needs is uh, growth and contribution. You grow and then you give. So we, we've done all the growth with them when they're maxed out on growth physically, they can now look, get new growth and learn coaching skills. They can learn psychology. They can learn neuroscience. They can learn how to coach people. They can learn how to, how to do a brand new job or run a new franchise business with us, which is new growth and its contribution because they're now growing by giving away all the value they've gained over the last couple of years to inspire somebody else. And to us, I've, I've told our mentees in the program, I've told you guys many times, you will never find better coaches to work for you than the people you've already brought through this internal 18 to two, 18 month to two year system, your developmental system. This is where you're with a football analogy. This is your Paul Scholes, your Ryan Giggs, right? These are your development homegrown people that you found them with, you know, when they were just starting out, you nurtured them for two years and they become world-class and PTs out there with 10 years experience can't even touch your clients in terms of coaching and, and living your core values and being right for the job. So we've also just found that overall that this client journey going in this direction is so important. It's so imperative. We get every client to that two year mark because we we need them to then, we need a pipeline of these kind of clients to turn around and work for us so we can keep expanding our business. So, and the longer you're in business, guys, the more you'll see this. And, and again, I, I, I was probably, I take it for granted that I was nurtured with this system through martial arts because, um, you know, I had to train for four, three to four years to become a black belt so I could coach martial arts. And then when I ran my martial arts academy, I had the same issue. When you run a martial arts academy, uh, you know, and I then wanted, I, I'd grown a few locations and I then wanted, a, or I needed a black belt instructor to become a coach and work for me, but you can only hire within the same organization with martial arts. I can't go and find like an MMA guy or a black belt over here and bring them into our organization. You're only certified to teach people in your classes if they've come from that organization. So I literally had to train my students for two and a half to three years to get them to black belt so I could outsource, I could outsource my job to them, <laughs> right? So, so to me, I, I'm just used to that long, that long play way of doing things. I don't expect to just put an advert up tomorrow and have some magical PT walk in the door who I can just give my business to and he's going he's gonna to run with it. It's not going to happen, right? So, so when we realize now that, that our clients turn around and make the best coaches because they're loyal, they know our core values, they've been trained in our system for months or years, they are living physical proof and they come from their inspiration is they come from the place where they just want to give what they gained. They don't even care as much about the money. Of course, they do care about the money a little bit, but it's not the main driver for them. They just want to inspire other people because they've changed their lives. And we are just certifying those people, give them their certification, give them insurance and put them in with the clients and they'll do a 10 times better job than any PT who walks in from the street, no matter how many certifications they've got. So this is this is changing the entire nature of, of where our employees and future employees and franchisees come from. We're not concerned about, you know, I've got, I've got an audience of fit pros, 
And I don't think about really like trying to sell franchises, our gym franchise. I don't think about selling it to other fit pros. We think more about which clients at the gym could we sell this to? <laughs> because we'd actually make a far easier sale. And most of the time, we, we, we would trust our franchise more with one of our clients who's been with us two years than we would from a PT we never met who just wants to give us 30 grand, right? So certifications and this stuff just don't matter anymore. It's becoming so obsolete. When you have your an internal system it takes much longer to get someone, but it is, I believe, fu fundamental to why we have such a sustainable, cash-rich, long-term business. And so we know that's going to become more important as time goes on, as more people lose their jobs in this recession, uh, and now we're able to give, you know, we're able to give clients an opportunity now. Clients who who who've been with us six months, a year, maybe. They work in corporate or they, they, they own a business or they have a construction company or whatever it might be. And now they've lost their jobs. And we're actually able to say, would you like to take up a career working with us in the gym? And they've never thought about that before. And 10 years ago, it, it wouldn't have been an option. It wouldn't have been a reality, but now it is. So that's where our client journey ultimately is going. And that's why the two-year mark is vital for us. We need to retain people to that 18 month to two year mark, because if we don't, we're never gonna have our sustainable pipeline of new coaches, which is what we need to continue growing our gyms. Because one last note on this before I move to the next question, but, but what, we're, what, we're, what we're seeing right now as a company is that, like I've taught you guys, there's three things you need in place to scale to multiple locations and keep your growth growing and growing and growing. There's no reason you can't open a new location every, every six months. Uh, one of my mentors, Sam Bakhtiar, at one point was opening six locations every two months. The only three things you have to have in place are, number one, the cash to do it, cash flow. You've got enough, enough cash to, to pay your setup costs and to have enough buffer money left in the bank so your other com your other locations uh, are not vulnerable. You need an audience in that area. You don't want to just open up a gym and then open the doors and say, who wants to come in? You should go and start building a list and building awareness in that area before you open the gym. And then the third thing you need is, is, is team members, talent labor. You need someone to actually go and run the gym for you. You can't do it because you're now stretched between multiple locations. So you need people ready on day one. When the first batch of new clients come into that gym, you need, you need trainers ready on day one to show those clients what you do and, and how great your service is. You need veteran coaches, not newbies. So what we're finding is we've got plenty of cash um, to set up and find multiple locations and buy out other gyms. Um, we have no problem building audiences and running Facebook ads and getting clients. The, 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 the limiting factor for us is having enough quality coaches to put in those gyms. Like if I had 20 coaches lined up right now who, who I knew we could trust and wanted to work for us, we would literally go and open 10 locations and give them all jobs, but we can't. It's lack of talent is the bottleneck in our growth right now. And COVID has played a little, <laughs> uh, national lockdowns have played a little minor part in that as well, obviously. But, but assuming things are normal and we're able to open up locations, I mean, we found we've, we've got leases on two new locations to open up early 2021, whenever this lockdown ends. Um, but we found at least three other places that we like we want right now. We could sign the lease or we could take over the gyms and have them right now, but we just don't have people to put in them to, to run them yet. Uh, and that's and that's you know on our part, that's just um uh, uh, a lack of building a pipeline or or we haven't built the pipeline as much as we could have, right? So that stunted our growth basically. Um, but you'll probably run into the same thing when, when, you, when you have a pro prototype that works, a location one or, and two that work, cash flow is coming in, you build up your cash reserves, 
you have uh, you you know how to run ads and build audiences. You're confident with that. The same bottleneck is going to be having people to work in those gyms, unless unless you want to work a million jobs. And so, if the future of hiring is to do with nurturing and training your own clients and converting them into team members. And there's still space for, you know, one or two outside workers as well. You can still bring in some PTs from outside or silverbacks as we call them. Like, you know, if you need to, there's nothing, I'm not saying don't hire other PTs. I'm just saying overall, if you've got a bunch of your own clients ready and willing to go, they'll do a much better job and they'll do it for less money and they'll, and they'll be more loyal to you. So, so Again, if, if that's the new model of recruitment in this industry, which I believe it will be in the next seven to 10 years, as this economy regrows again, um, it's going to be because there's an opportunity to do this for people who weren't previously aware of or able to do this kind of job. Then it all loops back to client retention has to be a long-term process because if you don't have that, you're not going to have a pipeline of new coaches and you'll be relying on outside talent which, you know, is more like 50-50 if it blows up in your face or not. So um, everyone's probably wondering what the heck I'm talking about at this point, so I'll stop it there. But does that make sense to everyone? Um, drop me a comment, everyone, if that makes sense, if this, is make, if, if this is, you know, maybe it's not relevant to you right now. But at the end of the day, guys, like success in anything is about long-term planning. And the unfortunate truth I see is that 99% of fit pros have not thought out their business more than 60 days ahead. All they think about is how do I get clients this month? How do I pay my bills this month? Which challenge should I do this month? What's my January offer going to be? That's as far as most fit pros have ever thought and planned their business, which is why they fail. Imagine if you wanted to be a Mr. Olympia or a bodybuilding champion or a world powerlifting champion or a professional footballer, and you only thought about your schedule six weeks in, into the future, right? That's what's going to happen to you. It's nothing magical. It's just, if you don't take this seriously and plan to grow a big business, you will not grow a big business. Work as hard as you want with a shitty plan and you'll just be burned, uh, burned out and broke. Simple as that, guys. Cool. All right, guys. So any other questions uh, or anyone got any other topics they want to discuss right now that we can go into? Feel free to jump on the microphone as well, anyone. Yeah, I've got another question. Well, um, if you don't have a current location, um, but there is another location unit. about 20 unit. minutes away that's kind of got a gap in the market and you're confident that it could work, but everything's ready to go for the first location, is it like, would you ever scale to a new town to a first location if you didn't have the first one? A unit, you mean, or yeah, like you have a location? Yeah, and yeah. Twenty minutes away from me, there's a town that's um, like there's a couple of units available that would be great, but I don't have a current location yet um, in my own town. And you're, you're you're talking about a unit here, not a location. You have a location because you train people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sorry, a um, unit. Yeah, a unit in a new town. So, what's the question again? I want. Well, is it like? Is it really risky, super risky to do that without having a fixed location in like the, the startup town that I've started in? You need three things to launch a new locate multiple locations successfully. Cash flow to do it, yep. an audience in that area, and team members ready to lead it. Do you have those three things for for the next day, next location? Yeah. Okay. So the risk, the risk, there's always a risk in doing anything, right? But so I'm not saying that you do X, Y, Z, and there's no risk anymore. Hmm. It's just you lower your risk if you have those three things in place. Right? So you have, you have the cash. And, and when we go more advanced on this, we talk about how much cash flow you need is 
to cover the setup costs for it, have at least three months of running expenses, including payroll of the new place. And you should still have enough cash left over to, to look after your current location for at least three to six months as well. So, so basically, if you had six months of spare cash from location number one, and you took a gamble on taking three months of that cash to set up location number two, now you have two locations, both with three months of cash flow available, but you have essentially halved, or you've essentially doubled the risk on your first location because it had a six month run rate. Now it has a three month run rate. Got you. Right? So, so the more, more important question is, do you have those three things for the location in your, in your current place? Yes. And you have it for the next location? I, won't, I don't have all of it yet for both. No, I'd, 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 I'd do what you just said. I'd have to take. How far away are you? What, what, what part is missing? Um, enough to do enough financial security for both, like six months of both. Okay, so how much? So if you were to keep a bare minimum of three months cash for, for the first location, I say three months minimum is the safety net. You will never compromise. Yeah. I think goes most with pros. If you haven't got at least three months of future cash in the bank, to keep your current location alive. Um, you you basically are, are not allowed. You, you haven't earned the right to open another location. It's like if you can't do ten push-ups yet, don't go near the bench press. It's just not that you can't. It's just not worth it, right? Mm -hmm. So. So if you did have three months cash flow to run locate the, the, the existing location, how much, how many months of cash and or, or you know, how much money would you have then to, to open and run the second location? Um, One month, two months? Yeah, probably after, after I set it up and paid for everything, I probably wouldn't have that much. I probably wouldn't have any more than two months. So, you know, so, so look at that, right? So again, this is where risk, the next thing is risk tolerance, right? Which is really on you and, and as an entrepreneur, how much you want to gamble because statistically speaking, like 90% of FIP pros have less than one month of operating cash in the bank for their current location. So even if you had three months cash for, for location one and you had two, only a month and a half or two months cash for location number two, then you're actually still in a better financial position than 90% of fit pros in the world. So if you're really confident, this is enough. So after you've got basics in this is like then asking me, it's kind of the same as asking, you know, I've got the basics in place. I know how to, I know how to squat. I can squat heavy. I've got my belt and my knee pads on. Should I go for that massive PR today, which could, either get me a PR or it could rupture a blood vessel. And my, my answer as your coach would be, well, how are you feeling today? Do you feel lucky? Right. Yeah. As long as if you didn't have the basics in place, if I really didn't think you're not strong enough to do that, you haven't done the basics first, then it's like the risk is just too high compared to the reward. Let's just not bother. And let's come back in a month or two. But if you've got the basics in place, like, like you have, and you think, well, location one is running at three months run rate. I could open location two and I've got two months to get it to break even point. Like, could you get it to break even in two months of opening operation? Yeah, I've already done the math. It's not like... I don't, you, it's yeah, not because, you're, because you're in a program like that, like you know how to do it. Fit yeah. pros who weren't mentoring with me, I would say probably don't do it because they don't know what they're doing. Mm. Um, you've proven you can do it therefore you can make bigger jumps and grow faster so I would never tell you don't do it you know if you've got one month two months then it's just how much of a baller entrepreneur do you want to be <laughs> how much do you want to take advantage of this situation right now how con if you're if you're super super confident that you can open a place for five grand a month cost and you can turn it and you can make ten grand a month out of it within three months 
and you risk going under by 5K one month if you don't make any money, like me personally, just, just me because of my DNA or my makeup or whatever, like I would do it. And if, and I would have a backup plan, if all else failed, I would beg my parents for five grand to bail me out if it fucked up. But I would know enough that look at my track record, I'm probably not going to fuck it up. So, you know, we would go for it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. So and at the end of the day, this all comes down to your perspective again of like, well, even if I would also think if I did it and then I didn't make it work, I would get, you know, and I lost 10 grand on it. Uh, I would equally have gained 10 grand's worth of value and education and, and perspective from it to come back stronger next time. If you're not scared, if you've already lost 10 grand on something, then actually you're more resilient and you're not, you're, you're less scared next time to take a bigger risk. Mm -hmm. Right. It's also the reason like the more I end up paying for mentoring to people, the bigger risks in business I take. The last mentoring I paid for was 10,000 pounds for 12 weeks of coaching with someone. Right. But as soon as I paid that money, then I was like, fuck, if I can, if I'm okay paying that money, and I just get one good thing out of this. I'm now more risk tolerant. I'm more able to take bigger risks. So, you know, uh, I would definitely look at that, but, but wherever you can, the next option is to, if you still, the only, the only caveat, I think, if we're talking in like before this year, I would have probably said, yeah, you know, you may as well just go for it. And if you feel good, you feel confident, and you've got a bailout plan, like if, if, it, if it's two months in and you've not made any money, like every single possible thing went wrong for you for some reason, like 0.001% chance of that happening. But if it did, could you have a backup? Could, could your parents bail you out? Could someone lend you some money? Like could a client help you out and put some money up, whatever? Uh, I would go for that. But from this year, because of this lockdown situation, that's the only thing that throws a spanner in the works. Um, and so I would, I would say if you're looking at opening more locations now, I would, I would put additional measures on top to reduce your potential risk from outside forces. So you, you've weighed up your, you overcome the internal risk. That's, that's stuff you bring to the table. You brought your own cash. You've got, you can get an audience and you've got trained team members. You've, you've absolved the internal risk, but there's also the external risk that you do everything right and then the government lock you down or Facebook just ban your account. Like you can do everything right, but then if those things happen, you're still at risk. So if you can do, if you can take measures to avoid the external risk right now, I think is a good idea which would be things we've done, for example, like um, we've, nego we've, we've signed a lease on, um, we've got a brand new lease for, for um, to start in January, 2021 for the new location. But we put into our contract that if any lockdowns happen, we are not charged any rent for that period. So, so yeah, we were gonna open in January. Now, obviously we're not sure, it depends how the lockdown goes. But it's okay for us because if, if lockdown does extend in the UK into January and we don't open until March, it's okay because we're not going to pay any rent on it because we work that into our contract and reduce the risk. So I would, I would look at that. The other thing, so, so if, you can, if you can put negotiations in your contract to protect you from COVID and stuff like that, that's going to be beneficial in 2021 because we might still have additional lockdowns in the next six months. The other thing you can do to mitigate risk because of just because this year is a little more nuts than most years is start looking to get other lines of credit. How can you use other people's money to, to take all the risk, right? So we've also done this in the sense with bounce back loans because um, we received you know, a good amount of bounce back loan uh, money from the UK government. That's the money we're putting into this brand new location, which is like a big hub. It's going to be about 30 grand set up, probably more. 
um, we're using the bounce back loan money, which is essentially money from the government that we've borrowed that we can pay back over the long term on a very, very low interest rate. So um, if you want to really get ahead, then you want to start looking at ways of using other people's money to fund the growth that you can borrow. Um, you could give away in, in return for a small amount of equity. You could do a loan, um, you know, or have I mean, a client who wants to invest in you or borrow money from friends and family, maybe. If again, you're 99% sure this is all going to work out, you've got a plan in place and you know you can make this new location profitable. Um, but you just use someone else's money as collateral just in case, then they benefit because they'll get, they have a high likelihood of getting their money back plus something in return, plus equity in the company or plus interest on top of the money they borrowed you. And you gain because you literally then put up no risk whatsoever. So maybe that's something you want to look at. If you work out your costs for the new place, and you think it's going to be five grand a month all in. And so maybe it's going to be 10 grand for setup. So you want 10 K plus you want um, five, 10, 15 grand for three months running costs. So you're looking at 25 K in this example. So maybe you, maybe you say, look, I'll, I'll put in half the money. I'll put 12 and a half thousand of my own cash, which, you know, might actually alleviate stress on the first location. And you say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see if anyone wants to take a little bet on me for the other 12 and a half thousand. And it could be, it could be two or three people chipping together. It could be one of your family members plus two clients. You could go to the bank for a loan, maybe use a bounce back loan, um, but ask around, right. And see if you can raise any funds. Um, Kickstarter, you can do things like that. And, and, uh, but start with people, you know, and talk to maybe one or two of your top clients and say, look, this is the plan. This is what I want to do. I'm 99% sure it's going to work. And here's my business plan to show why it's going to work. Um, but I don't want to put up all the money because I want to, I want to, you know, I, I don't want to use up all my cash. I want to uh, stay safe. So I'm going to put up half the money. I just need an additional 10 K from somewhere. If two or three of you would like to invest that money, we can do it as a potential loan. Again, if these guys are business owners, they'll have probably not much problem giving you the money. And you can arrange maybe to pay them back 5% or 10% interest rate over 12 months or whatever. Um, or offer them a piece of equity in the company maybe, and maybe they might just want that. So you can be creative right now and look for ways to gather funding and get other people to pay for it if you're not in a position to put up all the cash. And, um, or the other thing is, again, know your financial projections. If, ca if, you, if, if your first location is cash positive, money's coming in, it's growing, then maybe in just two, three, four months of waiting, you will have the cash you need to invest in it fully yourself with absolutely zero risk. So you've got to decide then, is it worth the trade-off? When people give you money, use other people's money to grow or invest the money, all you're really doing is buying time because you should never, you should never need their money to grow. If you go to an investor or for a loan or anything, or if you invest a bounce back loan, you should never invest that money uh, or never take money if you need it. And this is the paradox with investing. Because if you need my money to get you to the next step, I don't want to invest in you. But if you say to me, look, this thing is growing, I'm, I've got most of the money, or, or in a couple of, or in six months, I will have the money if I just wait and build up my cash reserves. But I've seen an opportunity and I want it now because there's a lease available, or now is the right time, or, or I've got an audience over there, or I've got a new team member ready to go. Like, if you think, look, I'm going to get there anyway on my own with my own cash, but I would like to borrow your cash in order to buy some time and do it now. That is what's attractive to an investor. Because it's like, wow, I'm now putting money into this thing to fuel your growth, not to create your growth, but this, you're going up anyway. 
I, my money is just going to help you get there faster. And then we, we both make money back faster. So that's how you got to look at investment if you want to take other people's money. But that's, that's what I'll be looking at this year. And inside the mentorship, we'll probably talk more about this subject if you guys want. We can talk about raising funds and, and invest, getting investment and things like that. Um, as you grow bigger and bigger, you'll probably, you'll probably be doing this a lot more. In fact, most major size companies only grow because of lines of credit. Did you guys know, know that um, Marvel Studios, for example, right? <laughs> Big fan of their films, but also their business model. Did you know, you know, Marvel don't pay or Disney or whatever you want to call it, the Marvel division of Disney, they don't pay to make any of their Marvel films. Like Marvel didn't, you know, like what was it? The last Avengers film, the big one was like $300 million to make and invest. Marvel didn't pay a penny of that, right? Because why would Marvel put up $300 million of their own money when they know they know that film is going to make a billion dollars at the box office. They know they have the confidence at this point. They have the track record. They have the business plan. Marvel knew, and they know that all their films are going to churn out a billion dollars now. Black Widow even will make a billion probably. They know they're going to make a billion dollars. So why would they chunk out their own $300 million when they can go to a, a pool of thirsty, hungry investors who are trying to throw their money at Marvel to get a piece of the action and say, hey guys, whoever wants to loan us the 300 million, we know we're going to make a billion. You know this is going to make a billion dollars. So we'll easily give you 300 million plus 10% of your money back on top. Easily, right? So if someone puts up, if I put 300 million up as an investor into Disney and I said, here's my 300 million, go make an Avengers movie. And they're going to give me 310 million back. So I wait one year, then I get $10 million back on my investment. I just made $10 million because Marvel made a film, right? That we know is going to win. People, investors are fighting over who gives Marvel the money, right? So Marvel just take their money for it. Now you might ask, the next obvious question is, well, okay, well, if they, if it's a guaranteed hit and they know they're going to make the money back, why would they, why would they take them someone else's money and pay out 310 million when they could just pay 300 million? And it's a good question. But the reason is number one, it protects their cash flow. They don't have to take out because you never know. Um, Keeping that $300 million in the bank could be very important because look at what's happened this year, right? If they paid out that money themselves, remember, first of all, Marvel are making multiple films at once. They're not doing one at a time. They're making multiple films. So if every film costs like $200 million and they're making 10 films, they're, 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 they're giving out $2 billion in cash. And that would severely, dis they'd have no cash left in the bank. Um, their cash position will be lower, their stock market value would drop down because people will have less confidence in them. And let's say they did do it that way. Let's say they did, they said, you know what? We're, we're making 10 movies for Marvel phase four right now. We know they're all gonna make a billion dollars and they will. And they put the $2 billion of their own cash out. They spent $2 billion on 10 films. And then COVID hits and shuts down all the cinemas and shuts down their production and all the actors they paid um, can't now act the scenes. And the cinemas they're going to put it in can't show the film. And the offices they now work can't do it. And now they're $2 billion less in cash. That could literally kill the entire Marvel business. See, what Marvel have done there is they know they've got the internal risk factors solved. They've got the actors, the producers, the script, the brand, the audience, the marketing. But they, but what they do is they know there are external factors that could still fuck them up, even if they do everything right. And so that's why they decide to let that big investment be in somebody else's hands. So that if it does go tits up, and by the way, this has actually happened. Um, 
with the with the Black Widow, uh, Scarlett Johansson film, Black Widow, their next film was due to come out right before the first lockdown in March this year. And that was projecting a billion dollars at the box office, cost 200 million to make. And they're in a stump now because, and this has caused real controversy behind the scenes at Marvel because, well, you, if you've invested $200 million to make it and now you can't, you can't release the film in the cinema and make your billion dollars, um, a lot of investors now are, are worried. They're not going to get their money back. And people, you know, Marvel fans have been calling for Marvel to say, hey, why don't you stream it, stream Black Widow on um, Disney Plus? It makes sense, right? But they can't because if they do that, they're not going to get the cinema release and they're not going to make a billion dollars on Disney Plus. So that means they wouldn't be actually able to pay back the money they borrowed to get the film made. So they're in a real pickle with this. And they delayed the film by, th by six months. Then the lockdowns were still going on. They've delayed it again till next year. And it's got to the point now where we don't even know if cinemas will go back to capacity. And if cinemas do open up next year, they'll be at half capacity, which means it can't make a billion dollars. It might just, it might break even. Right. And so more investors are now forcing Disney to say, look, put it on, you know, you need to, you need to, some investors are telling them to wait, don't show it on Disney plus because we're not going to make our money back. Just wait six more months and see how it goes with cinemas. And, and other investors are saying, let's cut our losses, put it on Disney plus, or we're not going to make any money. Right. And this is affecting Disney's schedule because they've got the next films in the timeline set up, they have to start releasing those films or their chronological order goes out the window. So it's a very interesting, uh, I, hope, I hope you guys are seeing the business lessons in this, not just my Marvel fanboyism, but you're, you're seeing the business, how the business works behind the scenes, why it's always better when you have a business model, you know is gonna work. When you have internal factors sorted, Again, cash flow, marketing, and, and talent, team members, if you have those factors built in, your foundations, it's usually always better to risk somebody else's money. Um, and, and, and all you have to do is give them 10% or 5% interest on top. And that 10% that, that Marvel pays, or the 10% that you would pay, if someone, if someone lends you 10 grand, and you promise to give them back 11 grand over time, all you've done is basically you've paid 1,000 pounds in interest in order to resolve yourself of any risk whatsoever. And also you've given yourself the option of a payment plan. Because again, if you had to pay the 10 grand of your own money up front, you would have to pay it and it's gone. And you're 10 grand down which means you can't market as much, you can't pay your staff as much. Whereas if you borrow the 10,000 and promise to give 11,000 back, you'll be able to pay that back over installments. So you only actually, you get 10,000, you can buy the stuff you need, you can pay the employees you need to pay, pay for the Facebook ads, pay your landlord for the rent, but you only have to pay back that money, you only pay your 10,000, maybe 500 pounds a month over the next 20 months or a thousand pounds a month over the next 10 months with an extra thousand for an 11th month on top. So you paying interest basically gives you that kind of payment plan, which allows you to pay the money back. I mean, you get money now, but you pay it back later, which improves your cash flow position at any one time. Okay, so Morgan, just to clarify, Morgan is saying here, if I have the cash for the second location, it's still better to use a bank loan with low interest and keep the cash. Yes, exactly. So you can see why now, right? Because if it's going to cost you 50,000 up front for setup costs and all the rest of it, you've got to pay 50,000. And that means tomorrow you are minus 50K in your bank balance. But if you get the money from the bank at a low interest rate, then you're 50K up and you've only got, you actually only have to pay the 50K month by month on the terms you've set. 
So this is why you guys pay for, this is why mortgages exist. Don't you guys agree it's better if you buy a house? Don't you borrow the money from the bank and pay the bank back? Remember guys, you guys don't own house. If you think you're a homeowner, you're not. If you, get a, if, you have, if you have a mortgage, you're not a homeowner. The bank owns your house. You're just renting the money from the bank. You're still renting. You're renting money from the bank to pay for the house that you call yourself a homeowner. Until you've paid off all that money, you do not own the house. If you can't keep the payments up, the bank take the house because they bought it for you, right? So the same thing, that's how we pay for things like houses. We'll get loans or buy, buy cars on payment plans. You know that when you pay a payment plan, a finance plan, you pay a bit more money on top, which is like a tax that allows you the freedom and the luxury to pay this over time as your cash flow comes in. So your cash position doesn't take a dent. Does that make more sense, guys? So, um, you know, and, and think of the RO, look at the, even if, even if it's a high interest rate, if your profit margin is bigger, it can still be a good deal, right? So if, you know, let's say you want to borrow money for Facebook ads and you know that, um, you make a 50% profit on your Facebook ads. So if you spend a hundred pounds on Facebook ads, um, you make, you make 150 pounds back that day. Right. Um, so you make 50 pounds profit on a Facebook ad. Right. So if you borrowed money at a 20% interest rate, so let's, let's say you borrowed, um, you borrowed a hundred pounds for Facebook ads with a 20% interest, which means you'd have to pay back 120, but you know you're gonna make 150, then you can still pay back the 120 and you still pocket 30% or 30 pounds profit. So in that case, even a relatively high interest rate of 20% is still a good deal for you because you've paid 20% interest to gain a 40% margin. If that makes sense, guys. So this is what learning about um, is good debt and bad debt, right? If you take out money, like, and do this, what I'm telling you, if you do this and borrow money on interest uh, or from the bank to buy a car, which is a depreciating liability, that's called bad debt because you've now used your money to pay for something that will decrease in value and will not pay for itself plus more. It will not cover the interest rate. You're not, you've used other people's money to pay for something that's gonna cost you more money each month as it depreciates in value. Whereas if you use this money to, um, use this money to invest in growing a business or opening a location or even running some Facebook ads or anything that you know you can make a net ROI within a very good time frame. That's called good debt. Okay. So, you know, I'm even surprised to this day that Facebook don't have, don't give lines of credit to um, business owners yet. Well, they kind of do in a way they, they let you pay for ads before they charge you for them. But I'm surprised Facebook don't give loans to the top um, Facebook ad, the top Facebook ad performers they see you winning with Facebook, making an ROI. They say, hey, how about, you? this is working. How about we loan you money at a 10%, we loan you Facebook ad money at a 10% interest rate. I'm sure you would do more, right? I'm not sure why Facebook haven't rolled that out yet, um, but they, they might do one day. So guys, yeah, um, we delved in some crazy topics there that uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to. Very macro, very big level stuff. But um, does this help you? Does it make sense? Or have I just rambled on for an hour about crap that doesn't mean anything to you? <laughs> and uh, do you guys have any follow-up questions? I feel sorry for Seamus is here as a guest today. Is Seamus, your head is probably just like, your brain's probably melting through your ears right now. <laughs> Seamus is probably like, I just, I just wanted to learn some Facebook ads. <laughs> uh, but this is the kind of, this is the kind of, topics and discussion that goes on in our mentorship because this is the real shit that no one gives you so are you guys happy with that today
Cool. And, you know, um, just, to, just to wrap up here, guys. So Trima said, I understand it. Awesome. Though he says, I'm nowhere near that level yet. And, you know, that's, that's understandable. Um, I get that. But also, but also, you know, that's something that I would have said myself years ago. But now with my looking back with my perspective of 10 years doing this in this, in this industry, um, I would also say that you've got to be careful. There's not underlying hints of limiting beliefs in there. Because when you say, I'm nowhere near that level, and if you've been through our FBB program, you'll understand what this is coming from. The first module talks about your identity. Are you a solopreneur, entrepreneur, or investor identity? And the, 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 what you, the comment here, I'm nowhere near that level, which I hear from many fit pros. So this is not aimed at you, but you fit pros in general who say this. There's an underlying tone where, where this line is coming from, this belief, not a fact. It's not a fact. You're not nowhere near that level. It's a belief. And the belief is coming from the identity that of, of you being a personal trainer or a fitness professional. So as a fitness professional, you're thinking I'm not near that level because I don't even have, you know, one gym yet, or I don't have 20 clients. You don't need gyms, but maybe the scaling from 20 online clients to a thousand online clients. And you think I'm not there yet because I need to get 50 clients first. Now, as a personal trainer or fit pro, yes, that you're nowhere near that level. But if you shift your identity to think as an approach, this conversation as a business owner, then that statement makes no sense whatsoever. No sense. Because what if Richard Branson was on this call right now, listening to this? And let's, and let's, let's say Richard Branson before he set up Virgin Active in 1986. Uh, or whenever it was. No, what, 96? It was uh, 18 years ago. Whenever it was, right? 96. So before Richard Branson set up Virgin Active, was Richard Branson a personal trainer? Did he have experience running a fitness business? No. So if I had laid out this to Richard Branson, say, hey, you know, Richard Branson and the rest of you guys, if you're interested in having a fitness business that works for you, you could open up one, two, three locations, or you could set up a funnel that makes gets you 100 online clients. Do you think Richard Branson would say, well, I'm not quite there yet? And let me know in the comments, guys. Let me know. Engage with me here. Do you think Richard Branson would, would have that mentality? Right? No, he wouldn't because he's not, he wouldn't be coming at it from a personal trainer perspective. He'd be coming at it as a business owner perspective. Um, and a business owner, like he did when, when he opens up or, or, or um, Duncan Bannatyne, another one from Dragon's Den, opened up Bannatyne's Health and Fitness. Just he's not a personal trainer, has no experience in the fitness business, but yet opens 10 gyms like that. So, so the only reason they could do that with no fitness experience is because they have money. Are you guys with me? So, so to say I'm nowhere near that level yet um, really only comes down to saying I haven't got the money to do that yet. Because if Richard Branson or Duncan Bannatyne were listening to this and they got the idea to open a boot camp or a health spa, they would go and do it because they have money. They're not going to think, well, I'm not good enough to coach 10 people or I'm not experienced as a fit pro yet. They go, no, I've got money. I'll buy the talent, I'll buy the people, I'll buy the building. So what Seamus then, or anyone that's like, what you're saying then is, I can't grow that much because I don't have the cash. But what we've been talking about for the last half an hour is using other people's cash. Make sense? So maybe you could be closer to that level than you think you are, if it's only down to having cash or not having the cash, and I've been talking about growing businesses by not using your own money, then you could be a lot closer 
I've, I've literally had clients out of my retreats in Cyprus, I had a client um, a few years ago. She, when she came to my retreat, she was running an outdoor boot camp with 30 clients and her and her daughter ran the boot camp. 30 odd clients, right? Paying 60 quid a month outdoor, outdoor boot camp. She thought she was nowhere ready to franchise, right? But we got her secured in a meeting with an investor that she was connected with by the end of that week, who then offered to give her 30,000 pounds to grow and expand the concept. She was making three grand a month with, or, or less than that probably with, with 40 odd, 50 odd clients. She thought, I'm not ready for multiple locations, but I was like, no, you are ready because you know how to run one location. So you surely know how to run three locations. What, you're, what you think you don't have is money, but what if we could get the money from someone else? If you know what you do works, then getting money will allow you to scale it to more people. So if you go and get that line of credit or a loan or investment from someone, and by the way, entrepreneurs do this all the time. This is why things like Dragon's Den exist because entrepreneurs all the time have great ideas or a little a proven concept, but don't have the money to scale it. This is why investment exists to begin with. <laughs> so when you look at it as a business owner or an investor, they would never think, don't do this because you're not ready yet. They would think you need money. Let's get some money. Let's go and talk to investors. Let's go and talk to uh, start a, a, a Kickstarter campaign or a GoFundMe campaign. Let's see if your friends and family can raise some money for you. And then you are near that level. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. That's just a little thing to finish on because your level of success, the success you have right now is determined by your language and the stories that you tell yourself. And that story right there is one typical story. I'm not there yet. Well, you know, the, <laughs> you've, you, you've got to be there. To, you can't get there to be there. You've got to be there mentally in order to get there, if that makes sense. Same way, like if I want to become, again, I want to get, if I want to get in shape as like a, a, a world-class bodybuilder, right? And I know world-class bodybuilders spend four hours in the gym every day and, and eat eight meals a day to perfect macros. Well, it doesn't do me any good to say, well, you know, I'm not quite at that pro level yet, so I'm not going to spend as much time in the gym. Or I'm not a pro bodybuilder yet, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, do my meals perfectly. But if I start acting and adopting the habits that a pro bodybuilder would have, and I do spot, start spending time in the gym, I do dial in my meals perfectly, guess what happens? Before long, I become a pro bodybuilder. So you don't get there to be there. You've got to be there in order to get there. So that language, and again, it's not just you, Seamus, it, this is across the board, we all have language that holds us back. You need to be aware of that language because it reveals your identity that you're operating from. And from your identity you're operating from, I can tell straight away, I can predict probably to 95% accuracy, your level of success you'll have in the next six months to six years. Before I know anything about your business, before I know anything about your locations or your cash flow or your Facebook ads or your offer or your pricing, I can have you give me one or two statements that reflect your beliefs. And I will tell you exactly where you're going to end up in five years. And I know because I do it on myself. Okay, guys. So I'll let you guys go for now. Then we'll get this recording up. I'll get this on YouTube as well. Cause it's a public one. Thanks guys. And I'll see you very soon.